Hey everyone, my name is John Dupin and this is my wife, Tammy Dupin. Yeah, thank you for joining us for today's teaching. Yeah, we hope it inspires you, encourages you, and builds up your faith. Yeah, so let's jump in. Uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, uh, Jesus is giving us a, a, a preview of something. But I want to ask a question as we get into the series that we're going to be in really for the next four weeks. Uh, why I don't believe anymore, which means that at some point I did believe. Uh, I believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believed in his church, uh, that we were to go and make disciples of all nations. And I believed in his mission to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey and that Jesus would be with us till the end of the age. I believed all that, but I don't know that I believe that anymore. I don't know that that's really where I am anymore. And some of you wrestled that with yourself or you've wrestled that um, with friends and family that, that may be in, in that boat. So the question that we're gonna ask for this series is, how do I prevent losing my belief in Jesus, his church and his mission? How do I prevent that? Or if we wanna say it a different way, let's just say, hey, let, let's, let's be a little snarky for a second. How, how would I ensure that? How, how would I make sure that I lose my belief in Jesus, his church and his mission and, and just do the opposite? So, to, so today we're gonna talk about one of the tools that keeps us, that prevents us from losing our belief. In fact, not only does it prevent us, but it actually when we practice what we're gonna talk about today, it strengthens our belief in Jesus. It strengthens our belief in his church. It strengthens our belief in his mission. So we're going to unpack this all over the next four weeks. Starting today in Matthew's gospel, chapter 24, Jesus is giving a template. He's giving a foretelling. He's saying to his forthcoming church, there will be a day after I resurrect from the dead, after I ascend into heaven, after I have been at the right hand of God and I have prepared a place for you, I will come back to get my church. Here's how you will know it's getting close. These are some signs. And he's talking about the church here. He's talking about you and me. He's talking about people who believe and follow Jesus. And, and, and this is what he says in, in, the, in the end of days, as, as, as time is, is coming to fruition in Jesus, he says this, he says this, and this is, he says, and then many, who are the many? The many is the church. And then many will be, and I want you to say this with me, one, two, three, will be offended. Come on, y'all, say it with me. Will be offended. One more time. Will be offended. Yes. We will be offended. Now, I'm going to talk about what that word means in its original context or its original language in just a second. But I want you to hang on to that. Jesus is saying, hey, if you want to know, this is going to happen. Many will be offended. Many in my church will be offended. Will betray one another. Ouch. Yeah and will hate one another. Wait a minute, that doesn't sound like the church. That doesn't sound like people who believe and follow Jesus. Aren't we supposed to love the Lord God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and, and love our neighbor as ourself? I mean, that's the greatest commandment. Why would we betray? Why would we hate? And yet Jesus says, when this offense takes place, when, when my church, when people in my church are offended, they will begin to betray and hate one another. Then, then what he says next, verse 11, he says this, then many, who's the many? It's the church. He's not talking about people outside of the church. He's not talking about who, people who never believe. He's not pe talking about people who, he's saying many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Who the many? The church. There will be people who say Jesus plus Jesus minus, Jesus isn't enough unless dot, 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 or Jesus maybe did it for you then, but he's not gonna do it for you now. And oh, by the way, we found a better Jesus. False prophets, he says, will deceive many. And because lawlessness, chaos will abound. Where is this chaos happening? Not, not just outside in the culture, inside the church, the love of many. Who are the many? The church. The love of many. The people who believed and followed Jesus. The love of many will grow cold. I don't believe anymore. 
don't believe in this stuff anymore. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in his church. I don't believe in his mission. I don't believe in the Bible anymore. That's a real thing. And I, I would say if we're honest, all of us at some point have, have grappled with that. How is it though that it, that it takes place? And Jesus gives us one reason, not not all of the reasons, but one reasons. And we'll look at three more in the coming weeks, but let's look at one of the chief ones. In fact, it's the biggest one. We would like to think it is, oh, we, we pulled back the curtain and we realized it was just this little old guy from Kansas. Tell the person beside you, it's the Wizard of Oz, right? right? It's like, oh, I figured it out. Oh, this is just hocus pocus. And, and I'm not downplaying that, but but... But oftentimes that's not what it is that causes us to not believe anymore because somewhere along the line, we said, my mind and my heart and my imagination have made this leap that it didn't make sense that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, but I believe it. And not only do I believe it, I'm, I'm gonna get baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but now I don't anymore. What happened? One of the chief things is we are offended. We're offended. What does that word offended mean? It's the Greek word scandalizo. It's where we get the English word scandal or scandalous. I like to say it like that. I feel so Mediterranean. Scandalizo, which means to go astray, to fall away or cause to sin. Where does it begin? It begins with an offense. I am offended, I'm hurt. I feel harmed. I am offended. I'm scandalizo. And therefore, I'm holding on to this. And therefore, I don't believe anymore. Not only do I not believe anymore, I hate these people. The reality is this. We are going to offend each other. Like, like we're, we're going to like each other one minute and then not. Right? And, and, and again, we, we'd like to just be talking about these third, fourth circle relationships, but the reality is the deeper the connection, the deeper the offense. Don't, don't, don't miss that. The deeper the connection. Why is it that total strangers can say whatever they want? I'm like, yeah, whatever. Uh, why is it that even somebody in the third or fourth circle of, of, my, of my connection can say something? I'm like, ah, that, that hurts, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll survive. But man, when my kids... When my wife or when Uncle Jerry, everybody's got an Uncle Jerry, right? I mean, when, when, when that connection, man, they offend us the most. It's the deepest offense. And the same thing is true of the church. We walk into the church and we, we go, I'm expecting all of you to meet all of my expectations, even the ones I don't even articulate. I'm expecting you to do that and I'm expecting you to do it flawlessly even though I won't, but I want you to do it flawlessly. And I want you to do it kindly. And I want you to do it before I even ask. And what happens? We realize, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. These are broken human beings. And man, they're in the same journey I am. And some of them are a little bit further along when I'm not. And sometimes I'm a little bit further along than they are. We will offend each other. Look to the person beside you and say, I will offend you. Go ahead and tell them that. Tell them that. Come on, guys. Second service. I will offend you. This is your chance. We're going to offend each other. We're like, most of us don't wake up and go, man, today, today, Ben Barlow, I'm coming after you, man. I'm going to say something that's just going to just trigger you, man. No, no, no. Most of us wake up and we're just trying to live our life. And we don't understand that our blind spots and that, that the things that, that aren't tidy in our life and, and maybe even some like sin cycles in our life, they're just, they're going to offend. And sometimes it's not even any of that. It's just, we are breathing oxygen. And there's something going on in that person's life that we are an offense. And the same thing is true of us. You have that person in your life that you just don't like them anymore. And you don't know why. And when they get in the room or when you hear their name spoken, you're just like, ugh, Jerry. Hmm. Here's the deal. 
If you want to ensure that you stop believing in Jesus, his church and his mission, hang on to it. Hang on to it. I'm telling you, it works. If you wanna get cynical, if you wanna come in here and hear Jimmy up here going, man, like, man, let's all, let's praise the Lord together and, and like shout to him and, and let's, let's just say there's nothing else and, and, and you just wanna roll your eyes and go, I bet Jimmy is a hypocrite. If you wanna ensure that, if you want to hold, like, put your hands in your pocket, if you want to, like when, you, when somebody's reading the Bible, you just kind of get, I don't know. When somebody gets up here and says, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, he on that cross eliminated sin, evil, and death, and you are a part of the family of God now and forever, and you have abundant life, and you're just like, man, whatever. Here's the deal. I'm going to tell you how to do it. Hang on to it. Hang on to it. Not only that one, start collecting them. Yeah, start collecting them. Because when we do that, we will eventually stop believing in Jesus. Or at least reduce our belief in Jesus and his church and his mission. I want to talk about holding offenses just for a second. Holding offenses. Holding offenses weakens our receptivity to God's grace and truth. It weakens it. We, we, just, we just stop believing this stuff. Why? Because it goes back to an offense. The gospel's offensive. The church and the people in the church are offensive. And they hurt us. And, and here's what I wanna say. Anything that we talk about today, as far as a solution, do not try it without the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna get back to that in just a second. What, what does Jesus say in Matthew's gospel? Look what it says in, in the Sermon on the Mount. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now, is Jesus saying that forgiveness is, is conditional upon my forgiveness? No, what he's saying is if you want to understand and receive in your own mind and heart the grace and the truth of God, you have to, you have to practice what he's given you. Yeah, 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 somebody got that. You have to practice what he's given you and that is absolute unconditional forgiveness. I release you of all debt and I do it again and I do it again and I do it again. Okay, next, look what he said, verse, verse 15, he says, but if you do not, forgive others their sins. In other words, if you hold it, no, nope, not, not, not gonna forgive you. No, and I have my reasons and, and I, I can tell people, I can tell people why this person doesn't deserve it. If you knew what they did, if you knew what they said, if you knew, you wouldn't forgive them either. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. However, if we're gonna believe and follow Jesus and we want to receive and understand and be strengthened in the understanding of his grace and truth, that God is crazy about you and me. He's crazy about us so much that he sent his, own, his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die for us and to resurrect from the dead. Then, then, then we'll forgive each other. But if we don't forgive other, other sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Again, is Jesus saying this is conditional? No, he's not saying it's conditional. He's just saying you won't get it unless you give it. You won't understand you won't get it. You won't comprehend the vast depths of God's eternal forgiveness through Jesus Christ unless you also and I also practice it. And guess where I get to practice it the most? Uh-huh, right here. Right here. Among the most offensive people in my life, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes. Somebody needs to make that t-shirt. Next. Holding offenses makes us bitter, cynical, and joyless. And let me just say this. These are the people that everybody wants at their party. Right? Bitter, cynical, and joyless. Holding offenses, press it down, collect it. 
What does it do? It makes us bitter, cynical, and joyless. And we show up at the party. And here's what happens. Here's what happens. A lot of times, uh, somebody like this may have stopped believing in Jesus and stopped believing in his church and his mission and didn't even know it, but stayed in the church and spread in the name of Jesus, the bitterness, the cynicism, and the joylessness. And where does it all go back to? Not always, but a lot of times. In fact, it's the number one reason. It always goes back to offense. I'm holding it and I'm collecting. I'm holding it and I'm collecting. I'm holding it and I'm collecting. Jesus teaches a parable in Matthew 18. He says, then the master called the servant. He called him in. He said, you wicked servant. He said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. I canceled all that debt, a debt you could not pay in Jesus's parable. The master is our heavenly father. We are the servant if we do not forgive the way our master has forgiven us. He, he says next in verse 33, he says, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? Man, God is so serious about this. If I am going to forgive you all sin, past, present, and future, yours and everybody who would believe and follow Jesus. I'm gonna eliminate sin, evil, and death in your life. I want you to practice the same thing for your brother and sister. The deeper the connection, the deeper the offense. Yes, and so you forgive it. You forget, I don't know about this way, man. What does he say next? Verse 34. In anger, his master handed him over to the jailer. Some of your translation says the tormentor to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This, Jesus says in his parable, is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive. He will turn you over to the tormentor. He will say, okay, if you don't wanna forgive, if you don't wanna forgive the way I've forgiven you, if you wanna hold on to everybody's debt, even though I have canceled all the debt that you could not repay, then you will be tormented by your decision. You will literally be caged up. You will be joyless, you will be bitter, you will be cynical. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive, which is, which means we can forgive. And who should I forgive? Here we go and oh, I wish it wasn't these people. I wish it was just people that I didn't have to see. I wish it was just people that I could just say, okay, yeah, I forgive them, I forgive them. Uh, your brother or sister from your heart. Oh. If we wanna prevent losing if we want to prevent losing our belief in Jesus, his church, and his mission, we have to let go of offenses. Not just once, not just twice, but our entire life, we practice it. I release, I release it. I refuse to hold on to this. Next, holding offenses invites the devil's influence. The devil, the word devil, it literally means diabolical. Since we're speaking Spanish today, el diablo, right? Diabolical, it means someone who creates chaos, someone who comes in to disrupt. When we hold on to offenses, it invites the devil's influence over our mind. Ephesians chapter four, the apostle Paul says this to the church. He says, in your anger, which, which, what does that mean? It means we're gonna get angry. It means that we're going to feel anger and frustration. In your anger, do not sin. Okay, yeah, 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 I'm not gonna sin. I'm not gonna sin. I'm angry and I'm not gonna sin. Okay, well, here's how you don't sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Get it off your heart quickly. Feel it and get it off your heart. Feel it and get it off the books. 
I'm angry. I'm frustrated. This really offended me. This really hurt. Okay, fine, 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 fine. Okay, great, great, great. Don't sin in it. Well, how, how do I not sin in it? Get, just get it. Just give it to the Lord. I don't need to defend myself. I don't need to get vengeance. I don't need to do any of that. And, and, and look, look what he says. He says, and do not give the devil a foothold. You know what a foothold is? It's when somebody's getting ready to close the door and you, you jam your foot in it. It's like, it hits, it hits the foot. And what it does is it leaves that little crack open just enough to kind of push the door open and get in. What is Paul saying to the church? He's saying, don't let anger fester. Don't let that offense take a root. Here's why. Because the enemy of your soul, the diablos, the diabolical will get up in your mind. Ooh. Hey, am I preaching? Anybody with me? Anybody with me today? Because I don't know. This is for me. This is for me. Oh, man. Yeah. Come on now. Yes. The uninvite. Oh, I like you no more. Ah, but that hurts my feelings. and I'm just going to let this one sit right there. Okay, fine. Push it down and collect it. Push it down and collect it. Here is the problem. Holding offenses ultimately destroys our belief. Ultimately, it does. Our belief in Jesus, his church, and his mission. Now, some of you are sitting here today and it's like, hey, man, look, I forgive people. I let things go. It's all good. Uh, but, man, I'm still questioning my faith. Stay in the series. So stay here. Stay here. Tune in. Tune in next week. There's enough for all of us here. But the number one reason the number one, and nobody thinks this. Nobody thinks this. Somebody says, you know, yeah, I opened up this book and it just made sense to me and this guy was making these logical and I, and I pulled back the curtain and it was this little man from Kansas and I figured it all out and so I don't believe in Jesus and I don't believe in, in his church and I don't believe in his mission anymore and you shouldn't either. And you just want to go, where, where does that come from? Because let's, let's just follow the thread. Let's keep following the thread. Let's keep following the thread. Oh, there was that moment your brother and your sister in Christ hurt you, harmed you. And you couldn't let it go. You couldn't forgive it. You, you wanted a pound of flesh. You wanted them to pay. And so you spent the last season or so of your life and now you open up the Bible and it doesn't make sense and you hear the name Jesus and it's like, whatever hear about Easter Sunday and resurrection and whatever. I get it. All of us have been here. Why? A lot of times it's holding offense. So, so how do we prevent this? How do we prevent this? And that's the question. How do we prevent losing my faith in Jesus, church, and when I get offended? How do I do that? So Matthew chapter 5, here we go again. Now, I want to say this to, to, to myself and everybody in the room. Do not try this without the Holy Spirit. Do not try this without the Holy Spirit. Jesus is preaching this before the Spirit came to the church, before his crucifixion and his resurrection and before Acts chapter one and two. He's preaching this, but it has to be overlaid and empowered by the Holy Spirit. If you try what we're getting ready to look at without the Holy Spirit, it will frustrate you. It will frustrate you, okay? So, so, however, when you and I practice this with the power of the Holy Spirit, we start to see something take place in our life that we never thought possible because it's not coming from our flesh. It's coming from the Spirit of God in us. I want to say this too before we get into this. We're not talking about the nation state here. Okay, some of you are going to say, what happens if Russia invades us and, and, and tries to take over us? And, and Okay, we're not talking about the nation state. We're talking about you and Uncle Jerry. Okay, now Uncle Jerry may be Russian. Okay, 
but don't send me this email. Okay, we're not talking about the nation state. We're not talking about law and order and the justice system. We're not talking about that. We're talking about you and Uncle Jerry. We, 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 we good? Okay, let's go. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He says this, but I tell you, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. What is Jesus talking? He's referring to the Old Testament law of retribution. And, and, and what he is saying is, hey, uh, uh, you know, the law gave you this, this sense so that justice could be served and accountability, but you guys have taken it too far. You now see this as personal vendetta. You now see this as a way to justify your own vengeance. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And what Jesus says, but I tell you, don't resist an evil person. What he's saying is this, don't, don't refuse. Don't refuse somebody who offends you. Instead, Look what he says, and this is, this is gonna, man, this is, do not try this without the Holy Spirit. Do we, do we mention that? Do not try this without the Holy Spirit. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn, give them the other cheek also. Jesus is using an idiom of the day, which is when someone offends you at the level of dignity and honor. He says, don't walk away from them. Don't refuse them. Don't withhold, right, forgiveness, Whew. releasing offenses. How do we do it? Jesus helps us refuse offenses so we can live in his freedom. Yeah, but you don't know my story. You don't know how offensive it was. You don't know the level of abuse and offense that I experienced. I understand that. It's very personal to you and it's very personal to me. It is. And nobody should downplay that. And Jesus gives us a line in Matthew chapter 7 and Matthew chapter 18 of accountability and reconciliation. None of that gets left off the table. What he is saying though is if we continue in our hearts to hold these offenses, even from the people who set themselves up to be our enemy, then we will go down a very dark path. Why? Because as the Bible says, my life without Jesus is an offense. And yet, Jesus died on a cross. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father and he says, I'm coming back for you. Is anybody in the house semi excited about that? Because I am. And here's what he says. He says this. He says, and you who endure to the end, you'll be saved. You'll be with me in all this. How do I endure? Oh, let me tell you one way that you don't lose your mind and lose your faith and start blowing up the church and creating chaos and letting diablos, that's as close as I can get, guys, into your mind and into the church to confuse lawlessness, betrayal, hatred up in the church, y'all. Yeah, I'm sure glad we don't have to deal with with that in our times, <laughs> nervous laugh. Hmm. Now, let's go to verse 43. I'm gonna skip some stuff, I'm gonna skip some stuff. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Once again, he's talking about modern or in his time idioms that have been taken from the Old Testament and twisted. He says, but I tell you this, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for them, pray for them, P pray for the people who persecute me, that offend me. He says this, he says this, this is, this is so good. He says this, that you may be children of your father in heaven. Did I mention, don't try this without the Holy Spirit? 
He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. Because you know what? I was once this person, right? And now Jesus sees me as righteous. Through Jesus, God sees me as righteous and sends rain on the righteous. Ooh, yeah, thank you. Oh, but wait a minute, and the unrighteous. He wants everybody to have a chance to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And you know what he wants me to do? The ones who offend me and hurt me and wound me, instead of me holding it and letting it turn my receptivity of God's grace and truth into a weak little faint power in my life, instead of becoming bitter and cynical and angry and getting my pound of flesh, instead of what? Instead of me letting the devil into my mind to say, yeah, I don't think you can believe. I don't think you can trust that God is good and that he is great. I don't think that you can trust that Jesus is who he says he is because look at his people. I don't think that you can believe in his word. And Jesus says, if you want to prevent that, let the Holy Spirit guide your prayers to literally praying for this group of people. Look what he says next, verse 46. He says this, he says, if you, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, the people who right now you like, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? He says this, if you wanna know about perfection or wholeness, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect and whole, what does he say? He says, here's how you can be whole. Here's how you can endure to the end. Pray for the very people. Release them. Release them of the debt. Why? Because you have been released by Jesus Christ on a cross, crucified and resurrected from the ultimate debt. Sin, evil, and death has no hold on you and me. And we are his church and we celebrate that. And guess what? We get to practice it with each other. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. Yeah, but I didn't even ask for it. I still forgive you. Well, yeah, um, I still forgive you. I love you and I pray for you. I pray for your success. I pray that rain falls on your crops. I pray that the sun would warm your face. Oh, come on, come on. Somebody's got a hold of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this is what makes, this is what makes a church endure to the end. That we release these things in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to, to see a story. And it's the story of one of our sisters in Christ right here at Waymaker Church. Uh, this is Sammy's story. And uh, Sammy came here when she was in college. She met her husband here. And uh, she actually, uh, she, she got married right out there in that field. And, and so she's part, of, she's part of our family. And she was courageous enough and obedient enough to tell her story. And I think it's something that really is relevant to what we're talking about. So take a look at her story. Um, so I grew up in a Christian home. Um, I was raised in the South and grew up in the same church for basically my whole life. When I was 10, I have a vivid memory of being in the back of our church sanctuary. And the pastor at the time, he had given a very clear presentation of the gospel. And that was the first time that I ever actually heard the gospel and understood it. And I remember, you know, walking to the front and meeting with the pastor's wife and telling her like, hey, like this is a decision that I wanna make. So by the time I was 16, I was really involved in our youth ministry, um, leading worship and I was a student leader. And so I had kind of helped facilitate like small groups here and there and discipleship type things. Looking back now, I can, I can see what it was at the time, but I then didn't understand what was going on. And so there was a period of time when I was 16 until I was 18 where I was being groomed by my youth pastor and um, I was sexually, emotionally, and spiritually abused by the last youth, youth pastor that I had. During that time, I knew and I had a conscious understanding of like, this is not the heart of God. Like, this is not okay. Um, but 
I didn't really know what to do because I was just a kid. There was a period of time when I had just turned 18 and so after that for about eight months the abuse had gotten really intense and once that eight months kind of was over was when the abuse kind of came out and the church severely like mishandled that information um, and it was swept under the rug. Um, I didn't feel protected, I didn't feel seen, I didn't feel heard, and I was actually told like, this is not your story to tell. That created a lot of deep soul wounds, as you can imagine, that I had to process through um, and still am processing through, but after that, I left for college, I moved to Lynchburg here, and when I started attending Liberty, I really just wanted to fly under the radar. I didn't want to get involved in a church again. Honestly, I just wanted to kind of blend in with the Christian crowd and didn't really want to like have any sort of involvement with a, a faith community again. I think I became really cynical of transformation that I saw, the Holy Spirit transforming people, I just became really cynical of that. Even like when I came to Liberty and was watching God transform people's lives here in Lynchburg, there was a piece of me that was like, yeah, but that's not really possible. I didn't see and believe it because it, I didn't, I hadn't experienced it yet. Through counseling and through stepping back into serving, cynicism like slowly fell away off of me because I was able to see like, oh, healing is possible. Like this is real, but it just, it has to happen in a, in a healthy way. The church is full of broken people. My hope is not in people. My hope is in God. And so it was a process for me to understand that the people who wounded me, the people who hurt me and, you know, swept my story under the rug and who ultimately like abused me, those people are sinners just like me. And Jesus died for those people who like, it would be so easy for me to point my finger at them and hate on them for the rest of my life. That would be so easy for me to do. But the truth is like Jesus, Jesus sacrificed for them too. As I got more involved here at Waymaker, there was this choice I had to make like, is the blood of Jesus enough in my mind to cover their sin too? Because it should be. That was a process for me to reconcile that in my head, to tell God, your blood, like Jesus, your sacrifice covers that wound too. And if you can forgive it, then I can too. Holding on to the pain and the memories and the wounds that I experienced was only holding me back from true freedom in Christ. Once I made the choice, like, I'm going to forgive these people, there was this release that happened where I was actually able to picture the compassion of, of Jesus over them before it was just cynicism and resentment and bitterness. But because of the sacrifice of Jesus, I now can walk in peace and freedom and forgiveness. It's interesting how the enemy tries to use the very things that God intends for good. The enemy tries to use them for, for evil. And so it was a journey for me to realize like, oh, the church is not a weapon for destruction. The enemy tries to get in and wreak havoc, but when it is done in a healthy way, when church and community are done in a healthy way, you feel Jesus in it with you through his people. I don't wanna downplay the intensity of abuse and pain and harm that happens, but I do just want to say like it is possible to walk in healing and freedom again and to have hope again and to see beauty again, but you have to fight for it. Like you have to lean in and, and fight for it. Yeah, that's powerful. That's powerful. I think, I think that might connect with some of your story today even that you know, maybe that wasn't the sin that was committed against you. Maybe it was something different, but it was someone that claimed to, to believe and follow Jesus. And in their brokenness offended you or sinned against you. And man, as she said, you know, that doesn't downplay the offense and it, it doesn't withhold accountability that Jesus preaches and teaches that, that all of us need. But what it does do is it says, how is this going to impact me and influence me right now and for the rest of my life? And in Sammy's story and the way that Jesus is showing us is 
it always comes back to, yes, I was offended, but I was once an offense to God in my sin, in my depravity. And yet he said, I send Jesus to make you right. I cancel all of your debt. I release you. Now go and live that out. Live it out, live it out. And that is truly how we strengthen our understanding of the grace and truth of God. It's how we fight back bitterness, cynicism and joylessness and instead embrace love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. It's how we say to our enemy, the diabolical, the accuser, Satan, we say, not today. You can't have my mind. You can't have my heart. You can't have my trust in Jesus. You can't have my love for his church. And you can't make me silent on his mission. Come on, y'all. It has to do with releasing the people who have hurt us the most. Thank you so much for joining the Waymaker Church YouTube channel. We hope this video encouraged your faith and brought you to the new and deeper with Jesus Christ. If you enjoyed this video, you can join us live every Sunday on YouTube, Facebook, and Church Online. Uh, you can also subscribe by hitting the button below. You can keep up with everything going on here at Waymaker Church YouTube channel. And if you enjoyed this video, share it with people that you know. It isn't about making our name known, but about making the name of Jesus known any way we can. If you would like to partner with us also financially and help the vision that God has for Waymaker Church, you can go to waymaker.church slash give and help fund everything that's going on here. Again, thank you for joining us today. Now go make a way.